I would like to just start the meeting um, acknowledging the passing of Dame Fiona uh, and our thoughts obviously are with uh, Robert and Lucy uh, and all those who knew her. It's a, you know, there's a major personal debt I'm sure all of us uh, owe, to, owe to Dame Fiona and I've uh, crossed her paths a number of times in my career and every time it's been a, you know, an inspirational touch and I've learned an enormous amount from her and uh, this picture is from a conversation we had as she was launching her statutory position as the, the National Data Guardian and apparently she told Claire this was the before and after picture. I know that the trust would not be anywhere near the shape it is without Dame Fiona's contribution uh, and I just like to have a very short moment of reflection for us all to uh, acknowledge what a wonderful person she was and what a loss to us all. Thank you very much, anybody, everybody. Um, it's a big loss to us all. Uh, and uh, I know you'll all have personal memories of Dame Fiona. Um, and I think the trust has a corporate memory of Dame Fiona and I need to acknowledge that now. Let's move on though to the formal business. I'm sure she would uh, chuckle at us um, having to work through uh, without her. Uh, can I start by welcoming um, uh, our governors who are observing? Um, so we have uh, Jonathan Wyatt and Janet Knowles, and I think Cecilia, but I haven't actually seen her um, in my list yet. So it may be that she's joining us uh, shortly. Um, I'm not aware of any apologies, and uh, uh, we are able to welcome Claire now. So uh, sorry if you missed that beginning, but uh, Claire. Uh, in terms of declarations of interest on the agenda today, um, Anne, uh, as always, will want us to note her interest as a trustee of the Oxford Hospitals charity. I'm not sure if there are any other declarations of interest that need to be recorded specifically for today's agenda. Thank you, doesn't look like that. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I just want to seek your agreement to us shifting the publish agenda around slightly so that we take all the maternity issues together uh, and that will enable us to uh, have uh, Ali Cuthbertson, Director of Midwifery and Catherine Greenwood uh, with us to uh, discuss those uh, and I intend to take those straight after we get to the patient perspective uh, and that will enable us to think about the maternity issues as a piece which I think would be uh, an important perspective for the board to get um, and I'm going to take it that that's acceptable uh, unless anybody tells me otherwise. Um, we also have um, Susan Paluka with us in case we need uh, to hear more about the background to the item on the constitution changes uh, and Claire Paulford will be joining us as Director of Medical Education for item 11 uh, on the agenda and I think that covers all the housekeeping Neil of uh, people who aren't always here um, uh, need to be acknowledged. Uh, Megan has come in on that. Megan. Uh, Chair uh, Claire Pulford will be here for the medical education and training paper. Indeed, sorry I thought I just mentioned that. I uh, must sorry. have read out in my mind and, uh, and missed that. So um, thank you. Um, can I turn then to minutes of our January meeting um, and I need to confirm whether they are accurate. No one's alerted me to anything that needs to be changed um, and that's great. And um, very unusually we don't have any open actions on the action log and we haven't identified any matters arising that are not otherwise on the agenda. That probably reflects the discipline that we've had in being focused on treating COVID and recovering um, from COVID. Did anybody spot something that um, Neil and I had missed? Thank you very much. Um, then uh, I think in relation to uh, Chair's business, um, I just need to uh, note two items. Um, one is that I reported last time that 
the uh, Council of Governors was going to be invited to um, uh, appoint two new non-executive directors. They did accept the recommendations uh, and we're just going through the process of pulling together all the paperwork that the fit and proper person regulations require us to see before we formally announce their appointments uh, and their start dates. Um, I'm hopeful that that will be uh, reasonably soon and board members will um, know that we're aiming to make informal contacts with the, the incoming non-executive directors so that uh, by the time they do start formally, we've begun to get to know each other um, a little bit. Um, and as soon as we are in a position to make the names, names known, uh, we will do that. Um, the second thing I think is I just wanted to uh, note, and I want to check with Jason that it's OK for um, me to say this, that the uh, financial governance review uh, has now got underway um, and we are aiming to be able to bring that to a board discussion uh, in May uh, and I'm grateful to uh, Jason uh, and also to Sarah Horden in helping in the process of getting that started and as you know uh, as well as Sarah Tony and I are on the um, the group from the non-executive side uh, that's an important thing for us to uh, keep the momentum on and uh, we will come back with the findings of that in due course. Um, those I think are the only chairs business um, that I have, so I'll pass over to uh, Bruno uh, for the Chief Executive Report and then I'll check whether any questions for either of us uh, after that. Bruno. Thanks, uh, Jonathan. And if, uh, if it's OK, I'll take the Chief Executive Report and the COVID um, update because they're overlapping and I'll just uh, rather than reiterate what's in the report, uh, maybe give the sort of overview of the latest uh, information. Um, the report clearly indicates that the second wave has hit the trust a lot harder than the first wave. Uh, report indicates that at the peak we had um, uh, twice as many patients in the trust than uh, more than twice as many patients in the trust than at the peak of the first wave. But if you look at the volume under the curve, uh, we actually had three times more patients in the second wave in the trust than in the first wave. So it's been a, a significant pressure on the trust and especially uh, for those staff members who were working in, in the uh, COVID-19 uh, areas, including of course the um, uh, level two, level three critical care um, units, which were uh, taking patients from MSA almost all over the country. Uh, not just the southeast region, but uh, far beyond that. So I certainly want to thank uh, the staff members that have been working extremely hard uh, starting in December, but going well into actually still this month uh, dealing with a, a large, large volume of patients needing um, uh, oxygen, but also critical care. And uh, that was uh, very um, burdensome. I must say on the whole uh, organization. So I want to thank everyone who was involved in that response. Uh, we were thanked um, publicly by um, the uh, NHS England team, but also by all of the trusts that were able to uh, rely on the uh, services of the trust during this uh, second wave, ranging from receiving nice letters to um, the clinical teams receiving muffins from uh, some of the uh, other clinical teams that referred into the trust. So there's always a bit of a silver lining when things are tough. Um, we were certainly thanked uh, for the, um, the services that we've given to uh, our patients, but also to the teams across, uh, across the country. Um, we're actually pretty proud if you look at what's in the report, uh, but we'll have more discussions today. Despite the pandemic, We've been very busy building um, and uh, if you walk around the trust, um, you'll see that our A&E departments, both in the John Radcliffe as well as at the Horton, have expanded significantly and look very bright and colourful uh, with lots of people busy uh, taking care of patients. So the, the space is a lot larger, it's a lot more um, patient and staff friendly. Um, it's loaded with uh, screens and digital equipment and new scanners, um, so it's pretty impressive. 
what we've done in terms of improving the services for um, the a and &E departments. Uh, but we've also um, about to open uh, on level five in the John Radcliffe uh, single rooms with uh, frequent air changes, which will help us to uh, be in a better place to deal with uh, any future sort of waves of this pandemic or um, any future yeah. um, pandemics. And of course, the board uh, does know that we received approval of the business case for a new critical care building, uh, which will be constructed on the John Radcliffe site uh, next to the trauma building. Um, uh, but besides sort of the emergency and critical care services, we're also uh, developing a new uh, unit for hemophilia on the NOC site. Uh, there's a renal ward in construction on the Churchill site. So um, uh, besides COVID-19 and the response, I just want to emphasize that we've been providing services in many other areas. All the urgent um, emergency services have uh, kept going. Of course, cancer, uh, maternity, etc., cetera, uh, have uh, been um, offering their services throughout, throughout the pandemic. Um, and some of them had to deal with uh, pretty disruptive uh, works that went on yeah, while they were providing those uh, services. So it's been from that point of view, um, again, I want to thank uh, the staff of working in these um, pretty disruptive uh, circumstances, but hopefully we'll come out of this a lot stronger uh, going uh, forward. The report clearly also highlights all of the uh, contributions that the university and the trust have made around the vaccine development, uh, but also I want to emphasize the, the testing program where we've been leading uh, quite a lot of the validations of tests, but also the piloting of new testing approaches with um, some very high profile publications coming out of the testing uh, program. We've been testing uh, quite a lot of medications to see whether they were working against COVID or not. And again, some breakthroughs came out of that uh, program of work which I think is a, is a real tribute to the science, uh, not just in Oxford, but uh, throughout the UK and uh, many universities and NHS institutions have been uh, working together to come um, to a place where we now have vaccinated quite a large number of people um, across the country, uh, but we also have been able to uh, offer vaccinations to all staff members uh, before the end of January, which is a pretty Astonishing um, statistic, uh, if you know that uh, we started with the first clinical trial on the vaccination on the 23rd of April last year, um, and we admitted our first COVID-19 patient in February of last year. So before we, um, uh, we reached those milestones this year, we were able to offer the vaccination to all of our staff members. That really also helped us to build some hope uh, with staff because it's been a very dark winter, a very difficult uh, winter, but the vaccination program has offered hope and um, we've invested quite a lot of uh, time and effort and uh, discussions with staff members, how we can allow them to recover from this difficult uh, period and give them uh, indeed some hope on a, on a better future uh, within uh, the trust with better working on working environment um, and better tools and certainly we've been able to uh, offer some of that hope with the vaccine program but also the major investments that we were able to complete uh, during the uh, pandemic. I'll leave it at that uh, chair and I already see a, a few hands up so I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thanks Bruno. Uh, Anne your hand was first. OK, just a small point, just to say that um, the investment that we've done in the Horton um, pediatric ED unit is behind me in my picture. So I just wanted to highlight that to you, um, which um, I know has been really well received by the staff and the local people. So just a just a, a mention of that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Katie. Thanks, Chair. And um, just something that Bruno didn't um, explicitly mention, but in his CEO report, 
Um, and it's it's related because it's to do with the Bain community. There's been um, an appointment of um, a new uh, recruit, Francesca Ridley, into the Bain community health and well-being um, area, um, which is great to see because obviously a lot of the um, anxiety that we've got around staff is to do with that community. So I've already met with her. Um, for those of you who don't know, I um, represent the board at the EDI Council, the um, Diversity and Inclusion Council. So I've already met with her to offer my support and she's fabulous. She's full of energy. So I just wanted to highlight that to say that that's one of the things that are going on in the background that was actually mentioned in Bruno's report, which I think is really worthwhile. Thank you, Katie. And um, I think we have the launch next week, don't we, of the, is it the week after, of the Lead BAME Leadership uh, Forum, which is another great initiative. Thank you. Claire. Thanks, Jonathan. I, I just wanted to ask about the vaccine programme and in particular vaccine hesitancy amongst staff. I, I think you said, Bruno, in a previous meeting that actually we were we were quite sort of strong in the area of having many staff vaccinated, but I wondered if we were experiencing any hesitancy and if so, what conversations are going on to encourage people to have the vaccine? Yeah, I'll have Terry come in because we discussed this yesterday at the executive team and uh, Terry can provide some feedback on that. Off you go, Terry. So we've identified all of the staff of, um, who we believe of, um, haven't quite yet had of, um, the vaccine. Of, um, we're doing a, a validation exercise to ensure that of, um, they actually haven't had the vaccine at home or elsewhere. Of, um, we will be undertaking individual discussions with all of those who who have uh, who we identify and who we confirm um, haven't had the vaccine uh, and we will be uh, looking to ask them why um, and looking to give them the appropriate support around so that they can uh, do the we will be making sure that managers have the discussions with with uh, with those staff in an appropriate manner as well. Claire, is there a follow up from that or are you happy with that? We'll obviously keep an eye on it because it's an important part of our staff well-being as well as our care for, for patients. Um, Bruno, before we, given that we're taking the sort of COVID response and recovery uh, item as this is as alongside your report, do you just want to say a little bit about the thinking of beginning to, to reopen up services that have been uh, restricted during COVID? Because I think as a board, we're concerned to make sure that we give our staff a break who need a break um, and we don't rush into opening things up in a way that um, will undermine our attempt to support those those staff. But also it will be a matter of anxiety, I'm sure, for the community about understanding what the trajectory is, is likely to be. Could you just want to say a bit about how we're going about thinking that through? Yes, yeah, so we had to uh, redeploy quite a number of staff into COVID-19 areas either red or amber, um, to deal with the, uh, the second wave. Um, as the wave now is uh, slowing down with a lot fewer patients uh, in the trust, those staff members are being redeployed to their original service and will then um, be able to uh, pick up yeah, the volume of patients that could be diagnosed and treated in those uh, services. Uh, we are uh, in discussions with the Oxfordshire system, the Bob ICS system, and are awaiting some guidance from the national regional team on the uh, recovery requirements, including uh, the uh, the financial um, uh, sort of envelopes that would be available, and to what extent independent sector uh, could still help with uh, the recovery. So what I suggest, because uh, it's still very much work in progress, is that we update the board as soon as we have more quantitative uh, information in terms of uh, volume of patients uh, and uh, sort of forecasts, uh, because that is still very much work still in progress, uh, Jonathan. Thank you very much, um, Bruno. I, I wonder whether at the stage in terms of our board agendas is because we we need to begin to shift back to our more normal cycle where we should think about this as a project as opposed to a regular update so that we should stop receiving a standing item under 
COVID-19 response and recovery, but at the appropriate time, um, you should bring a report to us on how we're thinking that through. Uh, so it's an item in its own right, but not one which is a rolling item, but which is about us understanding the appropriate oversight and governance for that. I, I see Bruno's nodding. So uh, unless anyone disagrees with that, I think we should think about this as any particular updates can be in incorporated as Bruno's done today into the chief executive report. But we should think about the recovery as a, a project that we need to understand at, at board level. And when we understand it, we can work out the appropriate governance that sits in with that from, from the board. Um, we're doing a similar exercise around the Council of Governors and beginning to return to a more normal business cycle. Um, so the Governors Performance Workforce and Finance Committee and the Patient Experience Membership and Quality Committee are meeting this month and we're aiming to get back to a a more a business as usual cycle but i'm quite keen that we don't just revert to the way we did business previously because we should take advantage of things that we've learned can go well during covid um but i think that means that we we're moving to a slightly different phase of our board cycle after easter um and no doubt if there is a third wave we'll need to adjust to that but i think we will uh, move back towards a, a board agenda that looks more like it did pre-covid any other questions either for my report or bruno's report can we uh, move then to uh, item uh, six and then we'll move from that to the various item tens um i might get into trouble for this at home by calling this a patient perspective. Um, so we're talking about the perspective of uh, people using our, our maternity services. We're not going to try to show the YouTube video over teams. Our experience of doing that, that is, it's a, uh, it's technologically tricky. Um, but uh, if you haven't already watched um, the video, I encourage you to do so. I've watched it twice already and uh, I'm grateful to Sophie, Kiss, Annie, Haley, um, and Kim, who uh, give their experiences of using the services, and I'm particularly impressed by the you know, the experience they had of uh, developing not just in maternity, but it feeling like it enabled them to be themselves uh, and a journey as a person. And Kim talked about being empowered and getting to do things her way. I've felt I should break into song at that point, but um, uh, it's a it's a really important, I think, uh, uh, compliment to uh, the Lotus team that that is the experience of women who clearly from what they talked about had worries about going into the maternity services that it might not enable them to have a good experience uh, and the Lotus team enabled them to do that. So if you haven't watched it, please, please do. Um, Sam, I'm going to hand over to you at this point to steer us through both the thinking about the patient perspective and the paper that the, the, the book of the film, as it were, the paper that goes with it, but also the various maternity papers. This is clearly an important thing for us to get right uh, and a good opportunity for the board to take stock of a number of lines of sight into the experience of women who use our maternity services. Sam. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I don't know, Neil, why my name's off and Terry's name's on as lead for this, so we might need to get that right just for the record. Um, sorry about that. So thanks, Chairman. There, as you said, there's a strong theme of assurance required to, at today's board in relation to care via our maternity services. Um, therefore, we felt we could further strengthen this with a focus of the patient story on the perspectives of the women supported by the Lotus team and the midwives that work within that team. We've talked about the Lotus team in numerous reports before, but as you say, I think the short video that we've produced really speaks for itself. Um, there is an extended version that I can ask Neil to share. Um, and it's a shame, as you say, that we can't use this um, because I think it really does speak for itself. But I saw many nods when you mentioned that video. So I'll ask Neil to share the, the wider version as well. So just as some background, the Lotus team commenced um, last year with um, six and a half midwives, supporting women and their families with um, a range of complex needs. Some of these include social vulnerabilities, women from a BAME background, people with disabilities, mental health issues, asylum seekers, 
trafficked women um, and women experience, having previously experienced loss. <clears throat> As you saw from the film, um, the team provides access really with one-to-one -one holistic midwifery care across all settings. Um, and there's a real strong theme of continuity of care, which is a significant um, government strategy throughout this, including both community hospital and birth settings throughout the whole continuum with an aim to improve outcomes and experiences. So whilst this is an absolutely lovely patient experience story, there is some real evidence based to improving outcomes through um, interventions such as this team. Um, but it ultimately also improves the experiences for women and their babies um, and their wider family. We saw other members of, of family on the video. Um, so I wasn't going to talk too much more. Um, we've got much to discuss, but I really wanted to bring this team to life with the videos, which, which I think we've been able to do so. There's a real interface with the safeguarding team as well. I think they'd be cross if we didn't mention. Um, we've, you can imagine with this group of ladies, there's often a need for safeguarding advice and support and um, intervention through other partners, such as health, other health colleagues, um, education, um, and sometimes the police to support them. So really great um, team that I've seen several hundred women in their fairly short lifespan. Um, and I think that um, when Ali and Catherine join, they're really, really proud of the achievements um, and improvements that the team has made. Thank you, Sam. Um, do we know when Ali and Catherine are going to join us? Oh, Catherine's here, I think. Um, so we will be able to move on uh, when we get there and we'll take questions on the patient experience, women's experience story. Katie. Thank you. It, it's all, uh, there's been so much um, in the papers about maternity and it's been really encouraging to see all of the positive things that have happened, not, not, not only um, in terms of the teams you put together, but the fact that the Ockenden report um, paper shows that we're already um, very close to, I, I hesitate to use the word perfection, but you know what I mean, in terms of everything that we need to, to have. Um, could you just clarify something for me? And this is complete ignorance on my part, and I do apologise. I saw a, um, a news item about the rainbow team um and the fact that they'd um there was a little little case study on one of the, the, the ladies who'd had um a baby through the rainbow team um do, do the two things intersect or are they separate or is the rainbow team something that wasn't uh, an oxford initiative i just didn't understand that bit that's the could you just sort of explain did catherine do you want to explain that or um, yes, um, the rainbow team is different. Um, it's for people who've lost babies um, in an, going through their subsequent pregnancy. And there are rainbow teams in other hospitals as well with called rainbow teams, but they're not necessarily people who um, are socially vulnerable, um, but they're vulnerable in a different way in that um, when in a, in a subsequent pregnancy, um, the memories come back and the anxiety about the care so the care that you need is different so oh. okay thanks it's just it, it wasn't entirely clear so it, obviously there's anxiety that could contribute to a bad outcome again in another in another pregnancy so I, I understand the differential thank you but other than that the papers that you have provided and the, and the patient perspective were just really heartening thank you thanks Katie um, it's hinted at in the patient story, um, Catherine, but it came through very strongly, I think, when we had the seminar. Um, uh, and it also came to actually when we had not the maternity seminar, but also the neonatal seminar that, that we, we've had, that the flexibility of the trust in trying to respond promptly to COVID and enable um, supporters and partners to be present when we can and uh, constantly keeping that under review. I mean, that um, user centred process comes through really strongly I think in the Lotus story and elsewhere and very much to be commended. Um, Tony your hand has gone up. Yep yeah, thanks Jonathan. Um, Sam thank you very much and, and the video is excellent. I was just um, wondering if it's possible to say a little bit more about the, the, the tangible outcomes of this initiative which are very significant in terms of maternal and infant health and I know in other areas there's um, been reductions in uh, children having to go into care, uh, in, improvement in, in um, infant health, etc. It might be worth just saying a little bit more about the tangible benefits of, of this uh, initiative 
in addition to obviously the, uh, the the patient recognition. Sure, thank you, Tony. So, and I wanted to thank Tony for his support. Actually, I was planning to do that at the, net, <laughs> the introduction to the main papers, but colleagues will be aware that Tony kindly agreed to support us as NED patient safety champion um, for maternity and neonates and has already joined two um, great meetings with the team to go through these areas and kindly previewed the video for us. So I think that the element around tackling health inequalities is covered pretty well on page six and obviously Catherine can join in. So no doubt the mental health um, opportunities and abilities for women to um, increase their confidence levels and care for their babies from a social perspective is, is there. However, the um, national evidence shows that reducing neonatal and maternal, maternal morbidity and mortality by 50% in 2025 is a key um, deliverable from this scheme. Um, there's a number of annotations in there that talk through. It's widely recognised that pregnant women from socially deprived areas, as well as women from a BAME background, are faced with a disproportionate disadvantage. Um, and I think that it was great, as Katie says, that we were ahead of the curve in the trust to have a team such as Lotus prior to COVID, um, where those health inequalities, I think, were um, the risk of those health inequalities were increased. So Catherine will probably be able to speak in much more expertise than myself on this one. Catherine, do you want to take that opportunity? Well, um, the Lotus team have, um, haven't existed long enough for us to, be, to prove this statistically for us, but um, it is um, the purpose of it, of course, is to is in recognition of the fact that um, um, continuity of care, particularly for group people who are at high risk of poor outcomes, which these people are, um, is very strongly uh, um, associated with improvements in outcome. And um, the the other way of looking at it is that for for us in maternity, um, we um, that that is the the big area that we need to focus on is is the fact that people who are socially vulnerable have poor outcomes. Um, that's been highlighted nationally when people talk about people from BAME communities, but that is almost the, um, very much driven by the socioeconomic de deprivation that's associated with um, people being in different races. And I think that um, um, we, we need to remember not to get distracted in, in Oxfordshire in particular, where we have um, lots of very um, people who are very capable of speaking for themselves um, and think about those people who are less able to. Catherine, thank you. I wonder if I could put a question really around that, which is, um, you know, the paper points out in its paragraph 3.3 .3 about the pockets of deprivation across the county, Oxford City, Bicester and Banbury. Um, I just wondered how easy it is for us to reassure ourselves that of accessibility of our services. Um, clearly, we're close to Oxford City and the Rose Clinic is picked up in the uh, in, in the document. Uh, we know about the Horton and Banbury. I don't have the same sort of sight line about Vista, and I just wondered you know, how easy we make it for people who have those disadvantages to access our services and whether there's any more we could do about that. So, um, thank you. Um, so that's something that I am interested in too. Um, what actually going back to the issue about the Horton that you just mentioned, I think that um, what's really important for, for us in maternity is to improve the um, high risk care that is offered at the Horton because um, actually the Horton's reasonably accessible. <laughs> Um, more so to the people who live in Bicester and very, very, very much more accessible to the people who live in Banbury. Um, but um, we don't have um, high, the high risk specialist clinics there at the moment. And, um, the, and how that translates at the moment is that um, women sometimes don't access high risk care um, at the John Radcliffe just because they can't get there. So we have a, um, a, um, a project that we've put forward for um, t 
to do for, for investment for redeveloping the Horton site so that we can um, in, uh, develop high risk, proper high risk care there, by which I mean diabetes and fetal medicine. Um, and um, because um, that is one of the things that um, we have been less able to provide since we relocated, um, reconfigured um, the services. Well, in fact, it was it was never high risk care there, and there needs to be. So, um, I I <laughs> what am I saying? I can't assure you that it's exactly the same in Banbury as it is in Oxford, but we have a plan to make it so. Okay, thank you. I think that's something as a ball we might need to think about our accessibility, um, and it won't just be around maternity, and we'll perhaps take away how to get a bit of a handle on that, Claire. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, I was just wondering how we establish the amount of resource to put into this service and whether we expect to need to expand it in the future. We need to be careful not to push Catherine into bidding for funds uh, in, uh, in the calls. So uh, it's a process for that. Um, so understanding the process, that might not be Catherine's question on that one. She can make it. Yeah, I guess it was sort of more about the level of support required. So, you know, you could have a cut off at all sorts of different so, levels. So Sam's taken the hint that I shouldn't put Catherine on the spot on this one, Sam. I think, I think um, that with Tony and I will talk with um, Catherine and Alison about an ev the evaluation that they'll plan to undertake at year end. And as Catherine said, we need to wait until the team's, um, you know, the team's delivered for a year so that we can hopefully apply this across to the um, both the health, mental health, physical health and um, patient experience outcomes that it aims to deliver to work through the impact um, and then potential next steps. So. I think it's great, great timing to have um, Tony on board with us. And what Tony's done is joined the Maternity Safety Champions and Neonatal Champions meeting. Um, and this is exactly the kind of issue that we'll be talking to the team about. There's quite a prescribed um, sort of standing um, agenda items. And, and this is certainly one of them that we'll need to look forward and bring something back. Thanks, Sam. You've got a lot of background noise. There. I hope it's not disturbing you too much. Um, are there anything else on the patient perspective, Lotus team paper, or should we move to the Ockenden report assessment? Sam, should we move to that? Um, I don't hear any background noise. Is it definitely? Can you hear background noise now? Or a little, yeah, um, I don't think it's. I think everybody else apart from me is on mute. If I go on mute and it's still there, people can nod. But um, it's not stopping us hearing you, Sam. It's just making you uh, it's gone now I think so hopefully it's all right I'm going to go on mute in case it's me Sam over to you okay so just to try and sort of navigate I don't is Ali Cuthbertson on the line yet Catherine we've got Catherine so we'll, we'll press on but I was hoping Ali would have joined us by now Neil might be able to help us with that um so as we said that there's a number of there's there's three which isn't the most we've ever had at board actually maternity related papers um, the first paper relates to Ockenden, which is, um, as colleagues will know, the output of an external review into care at Shrewsbury and Telford, which I'll come on to. The second is um, a required biannual safe staffing report, um, which links into the maternity incentive scheme, which is our, I guess, our insurance policy under NHS resolution. So they're the three reports I'm going to discuss. I'll start with Ockenden, um, and as we say, we have Catherine hopefully to be joined by Ali for in a few moments um, and Tony has been through much of this as well with colleagues. So just as a reminder of background, the Ockenden report was written following the review at, at Shrewsbury and Telford and that started initially following a letter from bereaved families raising concerns um, where babies and mothers had died potentially um, having suffered significant harm. And it was the then Secretary of State for Health, Jeremy Hunt, who instructed um, a review. Now, the first terms of reference into that review that started in 2017 only comprised of 23 families. And you'll have seen in the national media um, that that's grown significantly um, and they were amended. And this now encompasses over 1000 families care being reviewed. So due to the size of the review, um, we are expecting the final independent report later this year. 
Um, but having performed the first 250 clinical reviews, there was some significant emerging themes and recommendations for trust to consider um, who were offering maternity services to be addressed as soon as possible. So we've been fortunate just for the benefit of our governing body and for public minutes that the board have received um, both uh, an extensive seminar session from both maternity services and a separate neonatal services where a number of these areas have been discussed in depth previously. Um, we've also received um, the overview of the trust position in relation to the recommendations from Ockendon and the immediate and essential actions published in December um, last year. So just tracking back the timeline of requirements for us, the first requirement was for an initial declaration by Bruno as Chief Executive Officer against 12 specific urgent clinical priorities. And we submitted that to NHSI um, in December, very shortly after the report came out. The second requirement was for the Trust to, to implement a full set of seven Ockenden immediate and essential actions. Um, and the board reviewed those um, in an associated report um, at Integrated Assurance Report, and there's a requirement for us to bring this through to our public board meeting, which we're doing today. Um, the service have undertaken a gap analysis in relation to our maternity services, um, and that's been um, completed using the recommendations of Ockendon, um, and that forms the basis of this paper. In terms of outcomes, the Trust is compliant with the majority of the seven immediate and essential actions, um, with the exception of one that we've discussed at previous meetings, um, which is the risk assessment throughout pregnancy, of which we're partially compliant and expecting the digital solution um, to take us towards full compliance. In order to support our board discussions, um, there was also a requirement for a Trust to complete and take to public board an assurance assessment tool um, and that's been completed following um, the overarching review of a range of areas. So the seven um, actions, a workforce gap analysis, NICE guidance relating to maternity, our previous Care Quality Commission report, the Morecambe Bay report and Birth Rate Plus, um, which I took to Integrated Assurance Committee. So the assurance assessment tool has been reviewed um, at the IAC on the 10th of February. It's also been reported through the local maternity system, the LMS, and shared with our regional teams in February. And in order to complete the gap and thematic analysis, um, that needs to go through to the maternity tra transformation boards. So our maternity services, along with Eileen's team, um, have undertaken a significant piece of work um, to under, undertake a review of the report, the recommendations, and the Trust is compliant with the majority of recommendations in the report and action plans have been developed where work is required. Um, we can go into more depth on some of those areas where we've still to reach full compliance, but as I said, we've discussed many of them at the seminar sessions. The recommendation nationally that the board is asked to consider is whether the assurance mechanisms within our Trust are effective um, and within the local maternity system, they are assured that poor care and avoidable deaths with no visibility or learning cannot happen in our organisation. Thanks, um, Magna, your hand has gone up. Thanks, Chair. Um, Catherine, um, would you tell the board how learning from incidents is shared with staff and uh, implemented in the department, please? Um, so obviously there are different levels of um, incidents that are um, assessed um, weekly um, th through uh, reported um, through Ulysses and then um, those ones which are clinically of clinical concern are taken to the safety um, um, meeting on Thursday mornings. Um, and then um, some of the um, there's a statutory requirement um, that um, certain kinds of incidents where, where um, there's um, possible um, brain injury in the babies are re referred to the to HSIB for external um, um, assessment, but some some other incidents don't qualify for that and are, are investigated in house. So um, the um, at the end of that process, um, with the HSIB reports to can take a little bit longer, um, but um, the um, the um, it, and some of the um, events that um, happen need to be addressed earlier. So initially, um, if there are um, concerns about um, how um, things um, have been. 
um, conducted, those cases are, are taken to the um, um, intrapartum shared learning group, which is every Thursday afternoon, Thursday lunchtime. Um, and then um, when the reports come out, they are reviewed in, in clinical governance. Um, the safety um, recommendations are um, sent out as on a sort of um, at a glance, which goes to um, all staff members. Um, and then we have whiteboards on the delivery suite where we talk, where we, where um, event, um, learning is is also shared as as a sort of simple message. Um, and um, the, those things that are needed to be sort of um, reiterated are um, shared at the handover in the delivery suite um, and then with as far as the families are concerned um, so uh, also the, um, the the those ones where the babies died go to the perinatal um, review tool uh, tool which is a multidisciplinary meeting um, those cases are um, there's a, a formal clinic where the, the findings are shared by a consultant with the bereaved families, um, where there has where the, but, and where there's been um, an outcome that hasn't involved um, a, a perinatal mortality, then it, we would it. we would share the, um, the, the the meeting the the report findings um, with the family um, and make sure that there aren't yeah, any um, other issues that need to be uh, that. Of that they have concerns about that haven't been addressed in in the reports. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Um, I think the board can take a lot of assurance from that picture, particularly about the openness and the multidisciplinary nature of it. So as colleagues will know, I sat on the panel for the Morecambe Bay investigation you know, and there were lots of things that went wrong there, but the biggest single thing was the lack of openness and reflection on, on what was going on. And I think what Catherine has just described gives us a lot of assurance that we wouldn't be blinded in this organisation in the way that it was uh, in, in Morecambe Bay. So I think that's uh, extremely helpful to hear. Sam, your hand's gone back up. Yeah, it just struck me that Megan and I haven't planted questions, honestly. <laughs> it just struck me that it might be helpful if Catherine, in, in a nutshell, could just describe the governance architecture so that the board can be assured of the line of sight um, of how the maternity services oh Ali's here now which is great so it's it's all been on Catherine Ali so between oh, no. technological it's disasters just, okay it just struck me if I, I should have maybe just included a sort of governance architecture diagram so that the board could be assured of line of sight of how the services manager manage clinical governance and how that then um, moves up to the Clinical Governance Committee, TME. Um, we've obviously got our champions meeting and the reporting that the board have through board, but would you mind just articulating briefly how, how the service assures themselves in order to assure us? Do you want me to start, Catherine? I think Catherine needs a break. So, uh, <laughs> okay, out. yeah, no, that's fine. So the local um, opportunity to feedback um, is at... Um, each uh, ward and department level. So um, all of the ward managers um, meet with their staff um, The that feeds into the matron. So that's the day to day if you've got an immediate concern. If it um, the reporting through Ulysses um, is monitored and is really high in, within maternity. We have a meeting every day um, to review what comes in through that reporting system um, and we link in um, if there's anything of moderate harm through the trust processes. So we have two, two systems. We have the overarching system that is in for the trust and our local arrangements to make sure that we see and are cited with any incidents and it allows us also to put in that support mechanism for staff in maternity through the professional midwifery advocates. So that's what we do as a practical day-to-day -day reporting solution. We then have um, a variety of different forums. So you've talked about PMRT and the Embrace and um, all of those nationally mandated uh, systems that we have to uh, 
produce the data for. So there are a, a variety of multi-professional, multidisciplinary forums where all of those issues are um, put through um, the correct process before it gets reported externally and then through the Maternity Clinical Governance Forum um, up through um, the uh, Trust Reporting uh, Clinical Governance Forum through the Safety Champion and out. I think the other mechanism that is very important for us is that we have that direct feedback from our patients. So we run a patient um, feedback um, survey which we've developed a QR code for so the women can scan it and then that um, allows them to feedback directly, especially during COVID. We've done, um, obviously, uh, the staff survey um, and we'll use that when it's um, published to triangulate with what women are saying, what staff are saying around how it feels to be in maternity, either as a person that provides that care and or experiences care. So, um, and then we also run an open forum um, where people every month can come and raise particular safety issues that are not necessarily clinical. Um, so, I think that's the architecture. And within the governance um, reporting uh, systems, um, we, we have um, a team uh, that are specific to maternity and I think the last bit of the puzzle is so how do you make sure that um, you're training people in the way they need to be trained to provide that safe care and have those meaningful discussions so we have interactive learning every week we have bespoke uh, train together work together learn together um, multidisciplinary um, structured skills and drills through the prompt um, and we are able then to look at what we're educating people with and for um, in line with our outcomes and our policies and our national guidance so we tie that all together. Thanks very much uh, Ali. Um, I mean, I think this has been really helpful because one of the problems we've had as a board, I think, in getting our head around this is that we get segmented reports around the incentive scheme. And, and th this is the first time we've, I think, had enough of a picture together to get a sense of how the governance process works. And it gives us lots of assurance. Uh, Claire. Thank you. Just a quick question. And it may be that I've missed it. But could you tell us when we expect to be fully compliant with the Octon report? Um, I think because uh, it relies on um, an element of um, the um, IT system um, being implemented, I don't have a definitive date for completion of that, but the aim is to have it in within 12 months. Catherine's leading on that project, but if you're asking me for a date, <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I, I don't think we need a date now, Ali, but I think when this goes back to Integrated Assurance Committee, you should expect to have that question. And so um, next and time so we go around we'd that. Definitely we'd... Expect to be, we're expecting to be compliant by this time next year. Um, it does require the um, procurement to go through of the IT, new IT system and its implementation. Um, we um, are doing that as quickly as we can, but um, I'm sure you understand that these quick is relative in these circumstances. But by this, we want to implement that this year and have it working by this time next year. And too quick might not be a good solution if it then doesn't work effectively. Um, I'm uh, I'm keen that we don't lose sight of I think the the core ask of us today, which is whether we are competent as a board that uh, the visibility um, of the um, things going wrong uh, which was a big problem in Morecambe Bay and was a big problem in um, Shrewsbury and Telford is not going to happen in our trust because of the 
openness and the sharing of information. I think we've heard quite a lot about that. Um, I've got Jason and Sam, and then I think we probably should move on from Ockenden uh, to the, the other two papers. I, I'm conscious, Claire, in relation to your question, that probably by the time we sign off this particular set of recommendations, there will be another set of recommendations that are coming out. And actually, our assurance comes from the reflective scrutiny internally, as opposed to the compliance with questions outside. We don't want to wait for that. So we'll we'll need to keep um, our eye on this this ball. Um, but that's principally an IAC job, I think, as a board job. We, the headline is, are we confident about the, uh, the transparency? So Jason, and then back to Sam. Thank you, Chair. I was just going to make a, a, a response to your comment about the holistic nature of what we're seeing on um, Ockenden uh, and other things today. And um, I'll only make this comment once. I can make it under several several of these agenda items and it, it'll probably feed into the assurance later. But Sam and I and um, uh, uh, the, the maternity team are meeting to try to pull together effectively a a comprehensive understanding of the resources required for all of the separate compliance type requirements falling on maternity and just picking up your very last comment both the ones that enforce now but in as far as it's possible i'm also encouraging the team to stare into their crystal ball and think of any new compliance requirements that might land during the course of the next financial year as possible and and that will never be a perfect exercise but what we're what we're trying to get to do um, is to be able to be in a position of ensuring we've we've got a comprehensive assessment and funded it of the resources for uh, Ockenden, the requirements of the MIS uh, and other things that might be out there. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Sam. Um, just three quick things. One, um, when we sort of reflecting and rereading this over the last couple of weeks, I think I was very assured um, by the maternity governance infrastructure, um, the transparency and openness. And just to share with the board, the maternity leadership team have just last week had a focus group with the CQC. We've had verbal, very positive um, feedback from that, and we'll have more feedback in due course. Um, secondly, before Tony asks me, I think that actually for a future IAC, Ali's already done some informal benchmarking, but it would be good to understand across our LMS um, what areas of compliance and non-compliance, where potential to work together, but where we sit in the pack. Obviously, we've got our own accountabilities, but it'd be interesting um, to share that often digital solution and workforce are probably the two areas nationally that are um, the particular pinch points. And then thirdly, um, rather than marking own homework, I would like to just ask Eileen, on the hoof um, because it's her team that have scrutinized the majority of these reports um, to ensure that they're board fit and ready to come through and this is a significant assurance piece um, that the board need to be assured that we do have the systems and processes and the culture um, that we aren't going to be the next um, national maternity worry. Eileen. Thank you, thank you Chair. Thanks Sam. Um, yeah, from an assurance point of view, the, the teams have independently looked at this work and worked alongside with the maternity service to ensure that the evidence they put before us has been stress tested. Um, I think the, the maternity team are to be commended from their approach to quality improvement. I think they are constantly in pursuit of delivering the excellent service that we aspire to as an organisation on behalf of our women. Um, it, you know, it goes without saying that there's always room for improvement and I, I think the team are really cognizant of that and are very focused on trying to address any areas where they feel there is room to move from good to excellent. Um, and I think that therefore the job will never be 100% complete and we will continue to strive to give that excellent service. Um, from, from the Chief Assurance Officer point of view, I have no problem in commending this information to the board as long as it's taken in that context that there will always be more to do. But it's a really great step forward and brings together a huge amount of activity that this team have been doing, not just since Ockleton came out, but over the years with CNST, maternity standards, etc. Thank you, Eileen. I'm going to have the last word on this item and then Sam and you can take us forward. And the last word is just to uh, let the board know I joined the last Maternity Voices partnership to see what was going on there. And you know, it is very clear that the team cares about hearing back from the people who use the service. Uh, there was quite a comprehensive 
range of bits of feedback. It was mostly very compl complimentary and there were a couple of areas which felt like they were COVID pressures that were coming through in terms of challenges on uh, staff and uh, Ali was there and it was very clear that people were uh, taking those seriously and thinking through how to action on it. So it's another element, I think, of the visibility of the quality concerns um, that were there. Sam, the next item on staffing, I think, is an information item and the incentive scheme one just requires us to do a bit of discussion if my brief is right. Over to you. Hey. You're right, Chair. The maternity staffing is a, is a brief, I think, strong assurance report that shows um, significant progress um, since this time last year, I think, when um, Ali and the team were very actively recruiting. So I think that the board can take that as assurance. Just two things I wanted to um, bring out, because I think Paula might ask me. Um, the reference to KPMG within there is, is what we as a legacy of called our establishment reviews. It's not an external audit. So we're going to stop doing it. It's just a habit. <laughs> it's the template that we use for our establishment. So apologies um, for that. I did just want to flag as well, good practice around safety huddles. Um, that's something that Megan and I are absolutely wedded to. You'll know that that's coming forward as next year's quality priority. So great practice for safety huddles. Um, and I think the board can take assurance from this paper. Thank you, Sam. Um, is there any, this is an information paper, so um, we need to note it. Um, anything particularly people want to draw attention to? OK, thank you. Obviously, we also pick that up through uh, IAC and a number of other routes. Um, we should spend a little bit longer, though, on the maternity incentive scheme, Sam. Yeah, so again, just I'll give a brief overview and then we can open up for questions. The board are fairly familiar of, of the content and where we're at with this, having brought regular updates to the board. I guess the areas that um, and will be new to the board is feedback from the trainees, which um, I've discussed with Megan, which didn't require external um, reporting or action planning, um, but is of note. And I think the transitional care and the neonatal staffing um, is again something we've discussed in fairly significant depth only a couple of weeks ago with the neonatal team at part of board seminar. So I'd probably pause there and, and open to questions because I know the board are pretty familiar with this document. Thank you. Um, so you're saying that the stuff on the trainees hasn't been reported before. Was it a surprise to see it reported in this? Is it a long, a longer standing thing which we just haven't had visibility of or, or is it something new? Megana. Um, so it's a surprise to me, Chair, uh, because it's not flagged in the, um, you'll see in the ed education and training report, it's not flagged and it's never been flagged uh, from the deanery. Um, so I guess, um, you know, we need to look at what the gaps are, whether it's gaps in the rota or whether it's service commitment that stops or that they feel that stops the educational uh, component. Uh, of their training. Uh, that's something we should look at, even if it's not being flagged by HEE. So, Megna, what, what's the governance mechanism for that? Will you look at it? Will it come to IAC or, or it what? Should, it, it, it should go through the Divisional Educational Lead Chair um, for Suwon. Uh, for, and from there on to Claire Pulford, who is the DME, and then on to me. Uh, but, you know, this is something obstetrics is a very high, into high intensity um, specialty. There was previously about three years ago, there was attrition rates were in excess of 50 percent in the specialty. And I think, you know, a um, lot has been done nationally and locally to keep uh, trainees and support them and uh, and make sure that they get consultant jobs at the end of their careers. However, um, any any little thing that is raised should be looked at, I think, almost very promptly and see what it is that they're saying. So I, I guess the question for me, Megan, uh, from sort of the governance question is how we find out whether it's a little thing which is easily fixed or whether is it, if it's symptomatic of something that's more significant. So do you think perhaps we should leave that as an action for you just to brief us on your assessment of that, whether it needs special attention or whether it can be taken through the normal governance? So may I suggest, Chair, that um, I flag it through the Guardian of Safe Working report when it next comes to IAC, because it's not been raised with the Guardian either. There's no exception reporting with regard to lost educational opportunities. Um, so I just need to, Catherine, you and the divisional educational need, lead need to dig this further. 
So I think then the minute of this, Neil notes that the board um, uh, received the report that identified an unexpected um, concern around OBS and gynae trainees and that Meghna is going to assure herself um, of whether that needs to come back to the, the board or whether um, it can be taken through the uh, normal processes and the expectation is that it would come back through the Safe Working Hours Guardian's report. Um, but if Megan has any concerns over it, of course she can flag it with us um, uh, earlier than that. Thank you. Is there anything else on the um, uh, the item um, around the incentive scheme? OK, we are three minutes after the brief that tells me we have a break at five past ten, having um, done those items and the COVID um, recovery, um, which we did earlier. So, Neil, am I allowed to give people a break now? Are you comfortable with we're more or less on time? I would be entirely comfortable with that. Yeah. <laughs> OK, um, so uh, shall we reconvene at um, 20 past um, and uh, we'll be picking up the integrated performance report at that stage. On that basis, Megana, I think we get to medical education 11 o'clock or five past if you want to um, alert um, Claire to that. Thank you very much. Um, I will turn my video off and see everybody at 20 past. <laughs>